وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم ما بعد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. We continue our lessons from the famous book We are the Salihin, Gardens of the Righteous, by Imam Al Muhaddith, scholar of Hadith, Al Mujahid, Imam Al Nawi رحمه الله تعالى. We're still in the chapter of Fatlu Dua, the chapter of the virtues of Dua, supplication. Today, inshallah, we'll cover some of the things that must go along with the person supplication in order to have that supplication answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Shaykh he had mentioned in the beginning, the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ وَدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبَ لَكُمْ And he told the Prophet Muhammad, the meaning in English, say to the people, call upon your Lord. Call upon your Lord, and then Allah, he guaranteed, أَسْتَجِبَ لَكُمْ And Allah said, he will answer you. And this is from the Quran, Surah Al-Ghafir, Surah Al-Ghafir, verse number six. The last meeting we had, <clears throat> we stopped at the point where Sheikh Uthaymin, who's from our scholars of our time, who has died, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Alayhim al Jami'an, Allah have mercy upon all of them, <clears throat> the Shaykh had mentioned that this is a promise from Allah, meaning that Allah is saying that He will answer the supplication. This is Allah promising. So, this is the first point that we want to mention again that a person should feel confident, a person shouldn't have any doubt that Allah, when you call on Him with the ways and the conditions that He set for you, He will answer you. And how do we know this? Because Allah said, he will answer and know that Allah, Azzawajal, the mighty, the sublime, he doesn't lie. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la yukhliful al-mi'ad, as the Shaykh mentioned. And this is from a verse of Allah himself where he says that he doesn't break his promise. Then the Shaykh had went on to mention, Shaykh will say, mean, that dua here, it is meant to be an act of worship. And then he started to talk about the issue of dua being worship and dua being that the person just needs something that he's asking Allah for. And he had mentioned that if a person makes dua to Allah and this type of dua is considered to be a bada. Then the Shaykh he mentioned that this type of dua, if you were to ask a person similarly, why do you pray? Why do you fast? Why do you pay zakat? Why do you make hajj? Or why have you made hajj? Why do you or why have you kept the family ties? Why do you or why have you been dutiful and good to your parents, everyone is going to say he or she is doing that or has done that because he wants Allah to be pleased with him. So the point that the Sheikh is making here when he says the dua on or the ibadah, the dua here, it's an act of worship. It is because Allah has mentioned in the verse to the Prophet to say to the people, call on your Lord. Anytime Allah commands you with something, 
anytime Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeks something from you towards himself, then this automatically should be understand that it is worship. So the fact that Allah said to the Prophet, tell the people that your Lord said, call on him, then this automatically makes this issue of making dua worship of a battle. So if Allah says do this, or if Allah seeks this from you, or if Allah tells you to do something for him, not for him like he needs you, but do something towards him, then these are all clues that that thing, that action is worship. For example, if Allah says, like he says in the Quran, فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ خَافُونِي Don't be afraid of the people that you leave off obedience. Don't be afraid of the people that you don't say or do what's correct. Fear me. So that statement of Allah, خَافُونِي Fear me shows you that having a fear which will drive a person to do what's right is the act of worship. So fear is a type of thing that we have a natural mechanism in us called fear. If something is too loud, if something looks um, dominating, um, if something looks um, of the unknown, we have a mechanism in us called fear. That's not worship. That's what Allah has placed in everything that's created from humans to animals to insects. But however, when you talk about that type of fear in a person that will make that person leave what's wrong, stay away from what's disobedience to Allah, stay away from, as we said, the haram, that which Allah said don't do. You know that if you do it, Allah can punish you in this life. If you do it, Allah can restrict your provisions, your monetary means. If you do it, Allah can test you with some type of calamity because of. So these choices that you take, they're the choices that you want to stay away from wrong so that you don't get this punishment of Allah. Then this type of fear is the issue of worship. Why? Because you're staying away from something because you're afraid that Allah will punish you. You're doing what Allah told you in order to avoid that punishment. So that type of khawf, that type of fear becomes worship. Likewise, the asking Allah something that he has told you to ask him, it also becomes worship. Is that clear? Tell you. Then the shaykh, he went on, and he mentioned uh, the shaykh with a mean explaining the verses above that he remember no we brought. At the same time, the fact that the person is asking Allah after Allah has commanded him to ask his Lord, generally speaking, it also, this issue includes when you need something or a thing. So you have du'a in two categories. Du'a is considered worship. That is that Allah has commanded you to ask him and only Allah can be asked for these things. And then you have where you ask Allah to give you something. And this is called du'a al-mas'ala. Mas'ala means sa'ala, to ask. Mas'ala, a thing being asked. So you have dua that is a type of worship. Simply Allah is pleased with it. He's not pleased that you do other than that. For example, if you wanted to ask Allah as he has commanded you to ask him, there are certain things that you can't ask anyone else. You have to ask only Allah. So if you were to go to the grave, for example, Allah said to the prophet to ask, to tell the people to ask the Lord. Okay. So some things you can ask a human being. Okay, that which you ask a human being, he has to be alive, the scholars of Islam say. He has to be hayyan. He has to be uh, alayhi. He has to have the power and the ability to fulfill what you ask him. can't be supernatural. And then he has to be... Um, 
Malju. He has to be there, meaning either there in front of you or by communication, as we say by telephone these days, by text, telegram, meaning there has to be some level of communication that we know you're asking that person and he's answering you back. So these are the three conditions when you're talking about the dua that's mas'ala, meaning you're simply asking. And this, this includes Allah, but it doesn't exclude the human being, this type of dua. As if you said to a person, can you hand me that book over there on the table? They're in front of you. They're not dead. You're not talking to your grandmother that died 15 years ago in her room, in her chair, and she normally sits in the other chair. And you say, Grandma, can you have me that book over there on the table? Grandma's dead. So that's the first thing that's ruled out that you ask Grandma because Grandma's dead. She's not there. They have to be alive. Secondly, if Grandma was alive, for example, you said, Grandma, can you bring me the moon in one hand and give me the sun in the other? Grandma doesn't have the ability. So that is the issue of someone having the ability. And if they don't have the ability, like they are not alive, you can't ask them. And then, of course, they have to be there. They have to be present. You can't ask the Sheikh, A'udhu Billahi, he's way in Timbuktu, or he's in Senegal, or he's in Mali, or he's in Saudi Arabia, or he's in Egypt, or Canada. He doesn't know. He doesn't hear. He doesn't even know <clears throat> where you are, that you ask him, oh, Sheikh, you raise your hands in dua. Please, I'm poor. Can you bless me with some wealth? This is not permissible because he's not there. You say, oh, 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 great Sheikh, please, my mother is sick. Can you heal her? Have two clauses. He can't heal. Allah is the healer. And number two, again, he's not there. So when you talk about dua, ibadah, it should be understood. Allah commanded you to ask him firstly. That's what makes it a battle. And we said a battle, we loosely say in English worship. But this is a poor word, poor choice of words. Because Allah Himself, He said, Yani, to call on Him. And the scholars have explained anything that Allah is pleased with or that He loves from His commandments, then this is worship. This is ibadah. But when we say worship, we mean like a ritual, something that people just do. So jumping in the church, clapping as the Christians do, playing guitars and beating the drums with tambourines, they say worship. But this is not pleasing to Allah. So that word worship doesn't really fit Islamically unless you add something to it to make it fit the Islamic definition. So we should say ibadah, because ibadah is defined as kullu ma yuhibbu Allah wa yarabha. Kullu means everything. Ma, that which Allah loves. Yuhibbu, kullu means everything. Ma is that which is. Yuhibbu Allah, that which Allah loves. So everything that Allah loves, and how do we know Allah loves it? Can we do something and ourselves make it or create it to be something that Allah loves. Like the Christian, they say, God loves me. And they're jumping around, shouting in the church, ah, and saying stuff in the tongue that they said we're speaking in the tongue. Allah, they don't even know what they're saying. What tongue? What language? What's the vowels? What's the syllables? They said there's something God loves. Allah must In the church, they have instruments. Instruments. The Prophet mentioned they are haram. Wind instruments, horns, flutes, a different type of um, things that air has to go through them in order for them to make a sound. He says they call the devil. Then you have string instruments such as guitars and banjos and the likes. Prophet prohibit that. Then you have the issue of Allah Musta'an, the piano and the organ. Prophet prohibit that. All the uh, musical instruments prohibited. You have the drum, and this is where we need clarification for sure. Drum is prohibited. It's a musical instrument. 
when you read some of the books that talk about Ayy and Arusa, when a lady is married, the wedding party, and the, the eight celebrations, which we have two of them yearly. That is the one for Ramadan and the one for Hajj season. They say that it is permissible in these occasions to beat the drum. And in some narrations that people translated, they said, duh. Drum is prohibited all the way across the board. That's not what they used to use. Like the big, tall, bungle drum that is pretty red. They use it in Africa. It's prohibited. Then when they say duh, some people have taken that and said, oh, well, this is, this is drum. No, it's not drum. Duff is similar to a tambourine. Those who used to be Christian like myself, we know what a tambourine is. It's a small instrument you hold in your hand. It's round. It has the skin over the top. Some of them have little bells that jingle, like the cymbals to a drum. And some of them, they don't have that. You beat that with your hand. If it has the jingles around it, the jingle, when you beat it, not permissible. If it has no jingles and it's just the skin and you beat it on your hand with the other hand, permissible. This is duff. This is what's used on the e, and this is the thing that is used um, for Arusa, marriage parties or ceremonies for the female. Amma barakalawfikum. غير ذلك من آلة الطرب وهم حراما بإجماع. All of the other instruments, all of the other <coughs> instruments, pardon me, they are totally prohibited by consensus. And that's because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned that Sister Hello من أمتي, he said, people will seek to make okay for my ummah. He said, Boyfriend and girlfriend or just relationships, dating. Harira means you're free. So that means so and so can have you tonight, a stop for Allah. Tomorrow night, so and so can have you. Or today at lunchtime, he can go with this one. And by nightfall, he's going with the next one. No strings attached, no commitments, no harm. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, يعني ما باء اللام الحرارة سلك So he mentioned يعني الحرارة that الحرارة يعني to have dating freely Then he mentioned the silk and this is particular for men. For women, silk is okay. All the way across the board, a woman can wear silk. Some people say, well, if it's prohibited for men, then that means I can't have silk sheets on my bed because my husband will lay on it. No, I said, wearing. This is. You can't sleep on silk sheets. You can't wear it as a clothing. Except if you have some type of skin ailment and that silk is used for that skill ailment then the ulama said it's permissible because the property allowed people to wear it or had scabies and the likes during his time but other than that for a man for a skin problem he can't wear silk but he can lay on silk if he has a silk sheet or something like this there's no text to say he can't lay on it's wearing it then the third thing was al khamru intoxicants. And here it's general. Even though it's specific, all of the ulama, they agree. Hamal al-Mahmur, yani al al mafasil al mahmur al al That you could take something that's specific, apply it to general cases, or something that is specific can be used, as we said, generally speaking. And the terminology is close. Close. These two in Arabic. And these are found in the books of Tafsir. They are found in the books of um, Islamic jurisprudence, Fiqh. And this is a real principle that if Allah mentions something specific, if the Prophet mentions something, he mentions something. Let me drink a 
what my mouth is dry. Pardon me. If I want to mention something general, then that thing in very rare cases can be used specific. Most of the time, if something is general, it stays general. But if something is specific, it's for something specified in a certain area or for a certain thing, then there's a rule that says it can also be used all the way across the board within that same example. So here the point is that just because the hadith mentions khamar, which we know is from taking something and making a liquid from it, that most cases you add different things, sugar, barley, or whatever, you cook it, you ferment it, and then when you consume it, you become intoxicated. Your judgment is off. Your, your, your speech, depending on how much you use, may be um, impaired. What you do, you may not remember. This is intoxication. And it doesn't mean just dizziness, because the person can be dizzy from something that has nothing to do with this. But the point is that horror here is defined by grapes, dates, barley, and the likes. But it's general for whatever befalls the mind. So it includes misuse, inappropriate use of prescription drugs as for pain. If you take five or six of them, you become, you know, feeling so good, you don't know what you're saying, doing. This is intoxication. If it's some type of narcotic that people use for recreational drugs, such as marijuana, don't tell me it comes from the earth. Allah made it as halal. La. As some Muslims, old school Muslims, they have this um, wicked theology. It's from the earth is halal. Can't use cocaine, can't use hashish, the lights. So the point is this hadith, the prophet mentioned this, Qamar. He started with free dating, outside of marriage relationships. Then he went to the silk, except for a man who has some type of skin problem. Other than that, for men, it's prohibited. For women, absolutely okay, no matter what. Restriction for men, except for the one who has some problem with the skin. Then you have the intoxications of all types and last, the prophet said, al ma'azid, that which is musical instruments. And we'll seek to make it halal. And we'll seek to make yani, this issue halal. So the point here is that the prophet sallallahu alayhi he mentioned these things in the hadith. And if a person, by the same token, use some of these things like we used to use in Christianity, then all of them were prohibited. And this was a side note as we talked about the difference between a duck and a tambourine in English or a duff and a drum in English. The drum in Arabic is tabal and the tambourine in Arabic is duff. They're two different things. People have missed understood and just said drum. This is not correct. Drums were prohibited. That's tabal in Arabic. The thing the prophet mentioned was duff, the tambourine, while the jingles, the bells around the side of it. How do we get to that point? We're talking about a person calling on someone who is not able to do that thing that he asked for, not as that person alive, now is that person present? And we talked about that as being dua mas'ala, meaning you simply ask for something. Whether it be Allah or it be creation, creation with restrictions and rules, asking Allah, no restrictions and rules, you just ask him, then this is called dua al mas'ala, where you simply ask for something. The dua al ibada, then this has to be something that you ask Allah only. And this is because Allah had commanded you to ask him, generally speaking, and it is that which Allah is pleased with. So that type of supplication, we know that it is ibadah, 
because Allah is pleased with it, as opposed to different acts and things that people say worship, as we gave the example in the church of the drum, the guitar, and all of these things they claim God is pleased with, and they call it worship, but it violates what we know Islamically because Allah is not pleased with that thing, neither is it something that Allah has called us to do. So the Shaykh, he made clear that when you make dua to Allah, both of them, dua of ibadah and dua of mas'ala, they are together in its meaning. Whenever you call on Allah, it's dua of ibadah because he commands you to call on him and he loves it. And then, of course, you're asking for something, whether it's forgiveness, whether it's to enrich you, you know, because you're poor, and we don't mean ask Allah to enrich you. You're saying, oh, Allah, give me $6.8 million. We mean to give you what you need. That's enrichment. To give you what's sufficient for you. That's enrichment. To give you the things that will help you through this life where you will suffice, that is what's called enrichment. Whether it is to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you then these, all of them, are considered to be ibadah, while at the same time they are considered to be issues, things that the person needs. Therefore, when a person calls on Allah, he's making dua of ibadah, and it is also dua of mas'ala. You are seeking something from Allah. And dua al-ibadah is only to Allah. Dua al-mas'ala can be to humans, one to another, but there are three conditions. The, must, the person that is being asked must be alive, number one. Number two, must be able to deliver what is asked of them. And number three, they must be there. They can't be of the unseen or somewhere where you yourself don't have contact with them, but rather they must be where you can contact them, meaning in present, in front of you, or by some type of, we have now, we have different modes of technology that allows you to correspond, although a person is far away, so it's the correspondence between one another that must be there. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sheikh, he mentioned that he mentioned a dua or ibadah. The dua it is ibadah. This is from the hadith and Ibn Majah. No, I'm sorry, this is from the hadith and the sunnah of Imam at Tirmadhi on Anas. A dua al ibadah. The dua in itself, it is ibadah because Allah he loves it. As far as the hadith that people have used that are scholarly people of the past, a dua uh, the dua is the brain of worship and that hadith is not authentically reported on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam both of them in the sunnah the sunnah part me both of them are in the sunnah sunnah means somebody collected the statements and actions of the Prophet sunnah that's one of the meanings of sunnah if you say the sunnah of Imam at tirmidhi that means Imam at tirmidhi collected the different things that he could from his teachers and scholars of the Prophet's statements and actions and he gathered them in a collection so it's called Sunan At-Tirmadhi where At-Tirmadhi, Imam At-Tirmadhi gathered the things that he could about the Prophet's ways and actions and statements so the Sunan of Imam At-Tirmadhi you'll find this hadith that dua is the central brain of worship or that dua is ibadah, the latter is authentically reported, the first one is not. So when you see them in the books, you can't quote it, you can acknowledge that people have used it, but it's not authentically reported on the Prophet, so we can't use that as a proof. The dua is the mukhal ibadah, it is the central station of worship. The Sheikh, he mentions, Sheikh will say, man, <clears throat> that dua that the person asks for something, 
when he supplicates and asks for something, we had mentioned again, this is called dua and mas'ala, because he's asking for something. Simply asking makes it the issue in Arabic mas'ala, clearly showing someone is asking for something. While at the same time, if it's restricted to only asking Allah, then it's worship. And if it's something that you're asking Allah, and he commanded you to do that, he loves it, then it is worship. While at the same time, if you're seeking something, you want Allah to give you something, then this is also dua and mas'ala. Shem al is mentioning when a person makes dua, there is a must, there is no escape from certain things that a person needs in order to have his dua accepted. There are conditions. Conditions, something that must take place before you even make the supplication in order to have the supplication accepted in the first place. He said, a shrutul awwal, or rather a shrutul awwal, the first condition. And conditions are always something that you have to have prior to that thing. So if we say conditions of salat, that means do this before you pray. Without doing this, you can't pray. Conditions of fasting, you must have these things before you enter the fast. Condition of wudu, you must have these things corrected and with you before you make wudu. And here, conditions of dua, these are things that you must have before you make the dua. He says that ikhlas. Ikhlas. Ikhlas is usually loosely translated as sincerity. The Shaykh he explains, and taqlusu lillahi, and taqlusu lillahi, that you make it purely for Allah. But the kunu da'iyan lahu haqqan. Therefore, the one who's calling, then <clears throat> in actuality, he's only calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We understand this again when we talk about coming from Christian backgrounds, they might. And one breath be praying to what they say is God, and then they say in Jesus' name, Khalas. At that point, when you ask somebody, this is not calling on Allah as a person who's having ikhlas. Meaning you call on Allah alone. And you do it because it is worship or you're seeking something from Allah, not to show off, not to be seen. Neither should it be along with any other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, if you do that, kuntafi ibadatin. Then at that point, you are in ibadah, meaning you make dua to Allah alone, without adding anyone alone in that dua. The Shaykh, he says, la tushriku bihi shay'a. Don't add or ascribe partners to Allah or associate anything with Allah doing that act. Don't make dua, some people that make dua to Allah and the deceased. Don't make dua to the deceased and then add Allah's name in the end. Don't add the Prophet when you're making dua, some people they make dua to Allah and the messenger. Make dua to Allah, ask Allah. Don't make dua to Allah and the angel to bring. Make dua to Allah. La tushriku bihi shay'a. Don't make any type of adding in your dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa la ta'budu, wa la ta'buduhu, wa la ta'buduhu riya'an, wa la sum'atun. He said that don't make worship to Allah. Here, worship means dua. Because we're talking about dua. And the Prophet said dua is ibadah. So when he's talking about dua, here he's going to be back and forth between dua and ibadah. Because this is one and the same here in the subject. So he said, وَلَا تَعْبُدُهُ رِيَاءً وَلَا سُمْعَةٌ Do not make dua to Allah showing off. And do not make dua to Allah showing off. And do not make dua to Allah showing off, neither to be seen. We give an example. Wallah, some people they never pray sunnah, 
Some people, they never make dua except they in some type of jam. If they have leisure or they're alone, they don't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Astaghfirullah. They feel they are above that. They don't need to ask. But some people, despite that, if they're in a gathering and they see other people doing it, or they feel they may be criticized, for example, the adhan and the iqamah. The adhan, when a person says, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. To the end, he's calling the people to prayer. Avan. Then you have the one after that when the people get ready to pray and they add. قَدْ قَامَتِ الصَّلَاةِ قَدْ قَامَتِ الصَّلَاةُ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ Meaning we're about to pray now. This is the Adhan, the first one. The second one is Iqamah. The Prophet, he mentioned, alayhi salatu wasalam, in various hadith, that if a person witnesses the call to prayer and he's waiting for the prayer, that this time between the two is for reading Quran, making salah and dua. Meaning it's a special time that if you pray, the reward is there and it's different. That, you, know, you read Quran, you make dua, it's the time that perhaps it may be answered more than just the regular making of dua because of the virtue of waiting for the salah, the virtue of being and in that state of waiting for the prayer. Prophet mentioned you already are in salah. If you are waiting for salah, you already have the reward as if you already praying. This is a great time and a great um, manner for a person to make his dua. A great time and a great uh, manner that the person he makes his dua. So, the example we're talking about is showing off. Somebody who wants to, when the scholars, they bring this as a, um, a method, as an example. Someone, he's getting married. He's at the masjid, and the father or the uncle or the warden of the female is there. He has on his best clothing. He has a nice haircut. He's on his best behavior. So for him, it will be a stain, or will be a smudge against him, he feels, if they call the adhan, and he sits and he doesn't make dua. Other people are making dua. He doesn't want to look and seem unreligious. One of the codes and the condition for the marriage to the female, he has to be religious. So he raises his hands and he starts to make dua. While in his heart he knows that I'm only doing this because I don't want them to see me not making dua. I want the girl, man. I really want to get married to her. This is doing it to show off. And we should understand the issue of showing off is inwardly, but sometimes I mean, it's manifest on the people's tongue or with their actions. And then the issue of being um, heard, doing things so that people could praise you or you feel that you're the one for example, that has to do this all the time, and this could be an issue of dua, such as when we pray in Ramadan. Ramadan, it is a tradition of the Prophet ﷺ that you pray what's called Salatul Tarawih. Salatul Tarawih, the prayer that we pray in Ramadan, when the people gather in the masjid and they pray. It is known that there is something attached to that prayer, if you like, it is not an obligation. If you like, it is recommended. Prophet did it sometime with this prayer, and other times he dropped it, he left it off. That is to raise the hands and to make the dua after the salah and the end. It's called dua qlut, the prayer of Ramadan or the prayer that's connected to a salah. 
So a person, he feels that he wants the people to hear. I got this nice clue. I want the people to hear this. So he wants to leave the salah so that the people can hear his nice dua that he makes. But if he was praying at home with his wife or alone, he might not pray, let alone to make this type of dua. So these are two examples of why the Sheikh is saying not to do it with um, showing off nor to be seen or heard. So that's the first condition that you must do it solely for Allah. Have ikhlas in your dua. And inshallah tabaraku wa ta'ala. We'll take the second condition and then we will stop. And that is the shaykh who says <coughs> the second condition, a show to third. Second condition that the person must have when he or she wants their dua to be accepted. The shaykh he mentioned, the shaykh with Amin and Yakun. <clears throat> and you put dua that the person has dua and you put dua la udwan fihi that his dua does not have anything of transgression in it for in kana fihi udwan because if that dua has anything of transgression or sin in it then that dua that the person makes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fa inna Allah azza wa jal la yaqbaluhu la, yaq, la yaqbaluhu Allah does not accept that dua for example we have the famous thing where people want to say um, I'm going to make dua against him he made me mad I'm going to make dua against him people may think with this issue, you can say whatever you want in dua. No, you can't say whatever you want in dua. And likewise, there are some limitations when someone harms you that you have. One of them is that you can't ask Allah something against them because they harmed you. And it has to be that which is atlan. It has to be just. For example, if someone does you bad, you could say, May Allah give him what he deserves. This is not Udwan, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned Hajjazah Hajjazah Ahsan illa Ahsan. Is there any reward other than good for good? What does that say? I make Luha. And the reward mean your wage, meaning what you reap, as they say, what you sow, then what you do, you're going to get that back to you. So if you do good, good will come back to you. If you do bad, You'll catch that on the rebound. You will get that bad as well. So a person in reality who's done wrong, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated, it's like Allah Jaha Basu. Allah is allowed that you say outwardly, openly, publicly, evil. In a man, no, except a person who has been wrong. Allah is a light from people's statement that in it is public evil or public badness something that is going to be distasteful and I'm not doing it, except the one who has been oppressed he gets an exception he gets a ticket he can say it because he's been harmed and the Prophet of Allah so and said yani and be aware of the, the one who's making supplication, the one who's asking Allah, the one who's making dua, who's been harmed. Why? For anyone, Lisa, Bainahu, or Bainallah, Hijaban. Because there's not going to be anything to prevent that person's dua from reaching Allah. Allah is going to answer it. So here, this is an exception, but still, you can't do it in the one. It has to be equal to what they do to you. Like if somebody smacks you in the ear, you can't go in the house, and we know in the real world it happens, but Islamically we're saying, you can't go in the house, come out with a butcher knife stabbing. What do you have to Go in the house, come out with your um, baseball bat, break his leg. What do you have to Go in the house, come out with your knife, shoot him in the head. Lie. 
But if you were to smack him back in the ear, hey, this is fair. That's what he did to you. You can give it back to him. And we pray that people have better means of solving problems than violence. But we're giving the example. So the point is, when people are harmed and you say, no, I give him what he deserves because you're harmed or someone close to you who you love is harmed, this is not over one. This is not sin. Now did you go beyond the bounds. But what's going beyond the bounds, what's sinful is that you make dua against somebody in his proper, in his wrong form. You say something about somebody, they didn't know about you, you just don't like them. They didn't know anything to you, but you have something in your chest because they did something to somebody else. And you don't know the story behind it. You just jump on the bandwagon. So you can't make dua, or oh Allah, don't bless him to get no job. Or oh Allah, make him suffer. Or oh Allah, don't give him any good. You can't do that. For the Muslim, you have to always make dua for him of good. Or oh Allah, forgive him. Or oh Allah, guide him. There are some hadith where the Prophet for example, said to a man, La barakallahu fihi. May Allah not bless him. But this was because, again, he was commanded to give charity. And he gave a bad charity. And when the bad charity came, the old broken down, and the hadith had said, um, can, um, 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 donkey it was sickly, it was weak. What are we going to do with that? Who's going to be able to use it? What benefit is it? Why would you give it? For Allah's sake, something bad? So the prophet told them, the one who gave this, la barakallahu fihi. Allah is not going to bless him. And sure, Allah is not. But it can be also understood that he said, no, Allah will not bless him. And again, Allah is not. He disobeyed Allah. He didn't do what Allah said. Do you think Allah is going to bless him? What's a bada? That you do what Allah commands you, and uh, for sure, it's what Allah loves if he commands you, and then he's pleased with That's a bada. So if Allah commands you to give sadaqah, you can't give your worst stuff. This is charity. This is what people do with the masjid. They take the holy jeans, the old man got sneakers, a decent black house, and said, we're giving this sadaqah to the masjid. That's not sadaqah. That's trash. Sadaqah is something that you yourself would want. Something that you hold in value. And you give it for Allah's sake. That's why the reward is big, because you're departing with something that you yourself you want. So Allah is going to give you that back tenfold, a hundredfold in this life and the after. This is the whole idea of charity, not to make a person stingy. It's easy to give something you don't like. We do it every day. Something that you like, then this is what's charity. So the man gave what was bad. You think the man wanted it? No, he didn't want it. That's why he gave it away. And the prophet said, La barakallahu fihi. May Allah not bless him, or it can be understood, Allah is not going to bless him, which are both sahih. When that reached the man, and sahih means correct, when that reached the man, the prophet said that, the man said what? Something that was wholesome, something that was good, what well, he should have said in the first place for charity, and then the prophet said, Barakallahu fihi, Allah is going to bless him. Barakallahu fihi, may Allah bless him. So when we talk about dua, the second condition, it can't be a supplication or something that's sin and transgression. Or Allah bless me to get some money so I go gamble in the casino boat. That's the law. That's transgression. You're asking Allah to give you something that's wrong. You're asking Allah to give you something that's going to lead to more destruction. You can't do it. You have an ex-wife or an ex-husband. He wants to get married. She wants to get married. He moved on with his life. She's about to move on with her life. You hear about it, and you ask the Lord, oh Allah, don't give her no good. Oh Allah, don't bless him with nothing. Oh Allah, make him marry a witch. Oh, the blessed of shaitan. This is not from the conditions of dua. This is from that which is dua that has what is sin and transgression in. And these are the two conditions of dua that the shaykh wanted to bring. Al-ikhlas, sincerity to Allah, to Baruch wa ta'ala, that you don't make dua along with Allah or to any other than Allah Azza wa Jal when it's dua of ibadah and secondly that it is not any harm or transgression in the dua that's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yet taqabbal minna that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us and you tib lana and you tib lana hasanat and ala nizayna fi dunya wa al-akhira that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to wait for us a good deed in this life and the hereafter when it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yaqfu anna kathir that he pardons, forgives us 
wipes away most of that which we have of bad deeds. وَأَنْ يُبَعَ فِينَا وَجَزَاكُمْ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا And then he blesses us. وَصَلَى اللَّهُ 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 وَصَلَى الل